Okay. Hi, everyone. Thanks for the thanks for coming. It is my pleasure to introduce Lars Chitka, who is visiting us from all the way far away from Queen Mary. And we really appreciate him coming, <laughs> taking the trek over. Um, Lars did his PhD at the Free University in Berlin in the, uh, in the Menzel lab, where he studied bee color perception. And he did really cool work on bee navigation as well early on. And then after stints as a postdoc in, in NYU SUNY, and then as a lecturer in the Würzburg University, He's, uh, he decamped to Queen Mary, where he's been since 2002 as professor and is now a professor in sensory and behavior ecology. He's also the founder of the Research Center for Psychology at Queen Mary, and where he has done lots of really impressive work that he's going to tell us about today on, uh, on all kinds of aspects of bee behavior, cognition, communication. Uh, you know, he's, he's won uh, many, many awards and prizes and has been elected to uh, the, as a fellow of the Linnaean Society, the Royal Entomological Society and the Royal Society of Biology. And uh, I know that, that everyone here, get, uh, how many people have come up to me in the past week, a buzz about his, uh, about his, his, his book, uh, The Mind of a Bee, which he published, I think last year. Uh, and and how many people were excited because they had read that book, and so we discovered many many people have already read this book and enjoyed it. And I know that they're excited to hear him speak. So, welcome. Thank you very much for coming, and uh, looking forward to hearing you. All right. Well, thank you very much for the very kind introduction and the invitation. I've actually come from Mexico, uh, not just from East London. I just did a quick stopover in East London. Um, can we have the lights down in front here a bit? Um, thanks. Yeah, so I've um, researched these sensory worlds and uh, various intelligence tests for for a long time. Um, so why have I recently got presumptuous enough to refer to the minds of bees, which surely is a um, given what most people think about the um, how how insects work is a bit of a, a big step. Um, so I, I owe you a bit of an, an explanation. So what I want to explore today is certain aspects of what animal psychologists refer to when talking about animal minds or consciousness. And so I'll focus on a few, um, few lines that we've been pursuing. And these are representations of things of space and of things in space. I want to explore whether as opposed to a um, hypothetical animal that is permanently stuck in the present and only responds to currently incoming stimuli, whether bees could be said to have some sort of outlook at least into the immediate future and so far as they understand the outcome, the desired outcome of their current actions, and also whether they have flexible access to past memories and perhaps can combine such memories into new information. And finally, and perhaps most controversially, I want to ask if these could be said to have emotion-like states. There are some other things that animal cognition people also explore, including some bee people such as metacognition, the appreciation of your own certainty of knowledge um, representations of time and number, and so on. I won't go into these things today. Now, this I've nicked this from uh, one of Dan <laughs> Dennett's books, actually. But um, I think there is, in general, an appreciation that social insects can do very impressive things. But so the current thinking goes that, as opposed to the complex, complex things that humans can do that these come about by entirely different pathways. So on the left side here, we have a, a termite hill that at least in exterior structure superficially resembles, if you subtract the scale differences, the famous uh, La Sagrada Familia in Barcelona. And, um, but the, the, the idea is that in the social insects, such architectures come about entirely by so-called bottom-up processes, 
by they're constructed by individuals that have no idea of the overall desired outcome of the structure, that each individual is kitted out with some hardwired rules, and then somehow by lots of interactions of such robotic individuals, this um, complex structure somehow emerges. Whereas, so the thinking goes in humans, the, um, the um, structure comes about entirely by top-down planning. There's an architect who, who dreams up what he wants the final structure to look like and then passes on, hands down instructions to builders and engineers and so on. And this dichotomy between, or perceived dichotomy between simple bottom-up processes in the insects on the one hand and top-down ones in humans is something that I want to deconstruct a bit today. So the question of whether complex architectures and insects come about by such top-down or bottom-up processes, um, the question is quite old. So people have wondered about such magnificent structures as the honeybee's comb for centuries. And well, they should, because um, if you zoom out a little bit beyond insects, there is actually no other animal other than humans, of course, that constructs anything that's as regular um, as functional in terms of actual mathematical optimality in terms of um, um, material usage while, while gaining space and so on. Sorry, I forget the wasps. <laughs> wasps and bees. But um, if you compare a, a bird's nest or um, or a beaver dam, then they're relatively messy and in fact primitive affairs compared to some of these structures that social insects achieve. And Charles Bonnet, a Swiss naturalist, um, said the following, um, interestingly, about uh, the, the notions of top-down and bottom-up processes are implied in there in full. Placed together in the same room, 10,000 automatons animated with a living force and all induced through the perfect resemblance of their outer and inner being, if we admit the least degree of feeling in such in, in these automatons, even only such as is necessary for them to be conscious of their own existence, seek their own conservation, avoid noxious things, prepare useful things, etc., their work will not only be regular, well proportioned, similar, equal, but it will also have symmetry, strength, convenience to the highest point of perfection. Interestingly, this perspective sort of mixes a little bit of both. So it is overall a perspective on a bottom-up process by which you put lots of automatons together and then some of the structure pops up. But he refers to the automatons as conscious, as having feelings and some sort of idea of the usefulness of their structure. But of course, we do know that it's not quite that simple. You couldn't put 10,000 zebra fish or 10,000 fruit flies together in a common room and somehow expect them to build something they want, right? So it takes a little bit more than that. And the first person to um, experimentally and observationally explore the building process in, in honeybees was another Swiss naturalist, uh, François Hubert, who was the first to actually um, open up beehives and uh, insert glass screens into um, the walls and so on to observe what actually happens inside. And so the natural process of building honeycomb always starts at the ceiling of the cavity. And then bees use gravity as a reference to build gradually down until they've reached somewhere near the bottom, as you can see. Um, in this image here. And the first thing that Hubert and his team noticed when inserting glass ceilings into um, the, the, the uh, beehive was that the bees didn't like very much to attach their combs to a slippery surface that is glass. And what happened in that case was they um, started instead on the bottom and gradually worked their way up like a tower construction. And you might say, well, this still looks like a repetitive robotic kind of process. But if you had programmed a robot to mimic the natural process, start at the top, 
work gradually downwards, that robot would already fall flat on its face with this simple challenge, right? So unless you had programmed an additional routine saying that if you can't attach to the top, then start from the bottom and invert the whole process relative to gravity, but bees haven't been given that instruction. They've never had the challenge before in their evolutionary history to have a, a glass ceiling. Now you could of course program your robot with a perspective on the desired outcome that is a functional honeycomb. But um, if you had just wanted to mimic the natural process that already would fail with this challenge. All right, so Uber and his team, let's make it a little harder. So what they did next was to insert a glass ceiling as well as a glass floor. What happened in that case is that the bees would start on one of the side walls and build their construction laterally through the cavity until that reached the opposite wall. So another degree of freedom there. But the most remarkable thing happened when after this construction of the normally two-dimensional sheet of honeycomb had begun, the authors um, inserted a glass screen on the far wall where the bees would have reached a few days later with their two-dimensional construction um, as marked in panel B here. And what happened in that case was that rather than continuing their construction in the same direction until they've, they'd reached the potentially suboptimal outcome um, on, this, uh, on the glass surface and then perhaps build some structural reinforcement, is that days before reaching that outcome, the bees would amend their construction, turn the whole comb construction 90 degrees and attach it to the nearest wood wall. And so the point there is, why is this important? It's important because there was, the corrective action wasn't taken when the suboptimal outcome was reached, but days before this. And what Hubert, um, exclaimed at the time was, I acknowledge that I could not suppress a sentiment of admiration for an action in which the brightest foresight was displayed. Now, these experiments await replication with um, modern sample sizes. And of course, we would want to know how the consensus is achieved, which direction to turn the comb in and who does the, the prospecting about the um, potential target sites and so on. They're very visionary experiments, I think, in terms of probing animals' behavioral plasticity in a, num in, in a manner of using unexpected non-natural challenges. Now, the way that we now typically study bees' intelligence is, is more typically outside the hive in the context of flower visitation. If you look on the right, then one of the things, the first obvious natural challenges that a bee faces on a daily basis is, is flower foraging. And um, what bees need to do in that context is they have to be careful shoppers in the flower supermarket. That is, out of the several dozen or so plant species that might exist in any hive's flight range, you have to identify the ones with the best cost to benefit ratio. You want to find the flowers with the highest rewards, pollen or nectar, um, for the least effort. And once you've done that, of course, you need to learn which signposts, which billboards, which advertising is linked to these rewards. So let's say that you as an individual have discovered the, the blue flowers as being the most rewarding one, ones for the least effort. You then want to remember the, the blue signpost, the, the, the scent that comes with these flowers to predict the rewards that are contained in these flowers. And that's no different to what we do when comparing products in, in different shops. So you might at some point or another have decided on, let's say your, your favorite toothpaste um, where you found the quality is, is, is good, the price is acceptable, and then you stick with that product. You, you look out for the same packaging, the same advertising, unless perhaps the quality goes down or the price goes up, in which case you, um, you then have to resample until you find a new suitable product. And that's exactly what bees have to do on a daily basis. And we, in a sense, merely capitalize on the bee's flexibility in associating anything, any visual or offertory cues 
um, with these rewards. So what you're seeing on the left here is a honeybee about to land on a little platform with a, a droplet of sugar water uh, in front of an image of a human face. And after she's done this a few times, you can then present the bee with a number of different faces as with as in a, in a crime witness test. Of course, they're then spatially shuffled and there's now no reward present. And it turns out that bees actually are, um, are very good, about 80% at identifying the correct face, even with uh, a number of um, similar face images. Um, I've never done any kind of um, applied work in my life. All of this is largely curiosity motivated, but interestingly, within weeks of publishing this, I had this dude from the American Air Force in my office. <laughs> so this was a few years after 9-11, and the whole military, I think, then was flooded with um, billions of funding, and he, of course, wanted to uh, face recognition algorithms weren't that good back then, and they were interested in somehow capitalizing on the, the bees' visual memory capacities to implement them on swarms of flying hand grenades and so on. Um, I gave them a relatively short answer, but it was an interesting experience. Um, so in addition to having a good memory for the things that predict rewards, of course, what bees and other um, central place foragers need to have is a good spatial memory. So here's a, a beehive, a nest, um, that applies, of course, that challenge applies to um, wasps just as well, is the, the, the need to be really good at memorizing where you come from. Because if you fail as a, as a social honeybee, for example, it's just you that dies. If you're any one of the thousands of solitary species of bees or wasps, um, if you fail at that simple challenge to relocate where your nest is, you lose all your offspring, right? So selection pressure for a precise spatial memory um, is high. And just to illustrate the challenges of spatial navigation a bit, so you might all at some point or another um, have been trying to navigate a foreign city. This is Shanghai, where you, perhaps you couldn't read the signs and you couldn't easily ask for directions. Maybe also your phone was out of battery. So you had to use landmark memories. And I mean, even that can be challenging in, in a in an, uh, human built environment such as this one, but it's relatively facilitated by the fact that all these buildings, these landmarks are built, are made to be memorable are made to be unique, to stand out from each other so you can identify them. And of course that facilitates navigation. You can see the, let's say the Eiffel Tower in Paris from almost anywhere and can use it as a navigational aid. Now, conversely, a natural environment um, that animals have to navigate and is more like this. This is a landscape in uh, central Mexico near my, my second home. And I've deliberately chosen a foggy picture because that's actually quite common in, um, in bee-navigated um, environments. This is a completely pathless landscape. There's also no mobile phone reception. So it's, um, it is challenging, I can tell you, if you do any kind of um, um, technology-free hiking to find your way in this kind of environment. It's very easy to get lost. There's lots of aliasing, which are not just individual trees that look similar, but uh, also hill shapes that look similar and so on. But it's a challenge that a bee or any other natural animal, animal with a home needs to master on a daily basis without fail. So you could imagine that your nest is in or under this tree that you can just so barely uh, make out here, that your good nectar patches behind the hillock over on the right, and, um, and pollen might be over here on the left. So these are destinations kilometers apart, and you have to be able, irrespective of weather conditions and so on, to navigate reliably between them. And of course, all of this with a really tiny brain. So it's not a trivial challenge. Now, the way we usually study bee navigation nowadays is, this, is with this equipment called harmonic radar, where the, the, top, the bottom dish basically emits a signal 
which is picked up and transposed to a different frequency by this uh, device that looks like an antenna. It's actually a transponder on the bee's back. And the reflected signal is then picked up by the top dish. And in that way, we can follow bees over their entire lifetimes. This is also a 3D radar tracking device. So what we've done here, this is a honeybee drone. And we're following this flight in three dimensions. And of course, what the 3D component means is we can't only check where the bee is and how high, but also what the bee sees to some extent from its own cockpit, right? So what we're um, depicting here, these boomerang shapes are a bee's eyes, and we're reconstructing the, um, the spatial view of the environment as she's navigating along this course. And you can see that this um, is it's very pixelated, so there, there is fewer spatial, less spatial detail that a bee can resolve any insect can resolve to compare it to a human. On the other hand, um, they process information faster than we do. So by, by rapid scanning movements, they can, to some extent, compensate for this lack of um, spatial detail. Now, one of the many challenges that a bee also has to um, um, manage on a daily basis is a version of the traveling salesman problem. The, the challenge that, as the name suggests, the traveling salesperson has to link, let's say, multiple different stores of a particular bookstore chain um, in, in a number of different cities in the course of the day. And what you want to do is do that in a manner that minimizes travel distance and energy expenditure and so on. And here's a simple version of that kind of problem for a bee. So we have a hive down here. We have five uh, locations that the bee needs to visit to fill her tummy once. You can see a track here, which is clearly not yet optimal because that's an, an early track. Um, in the color coding here, you'll see this a number of times. Green is always early, yellow, orange in the middle, and red is late. So this is um, uh, an, an early track but we can then monitor because we can track bees over their entire lifetimes, um, how a bee improves with experience and with time um, if she runs through a course like that multiple times. So she's now found the first two feeding stations where in bout two, the bout counter is up on the top left corner. Now she's found two more, now she's found the fifth. But you can see there's still a great deal of exploration all around the area in which, um, food is potentially to be found. But with time and with experience, the route becomes more and more streamlined until in the end, the bee actually finds the optimal route and then sticks with it for, oops, for, for um, multiple times over. So they're very good at solving these at least simple versions of the traveling salesman problem. Now, one other thing that we're also interested in doing, because we have this ability to track bees from their maiden flight to their death, basically, is how does a bee organize its own foraging career when it's left to its own devices? We're not setting any challenges here. Um, we're just, this is in a sense, an observational study where we're just asking a bee, um, do it all yourself. Find your own flowers and, and we'll just monitor you. And here's a, 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 the first flight ever of an individual bee sped up 130 times. And what you can see, so the blue dot is its nest, um, is that it loops in various directions, never the same direction, always coming back to the point of origin, not entering the nest, but then flying out in a different direction to explore some more. And the total of this flight was over two hours long. You can see now that the bee has visited a uh, forest edge um, up here, um, and that will become of, of interest um, a bit later. Now we're following that same bee for several dozen foraging bouts, um, several days in fact, and you can see that again green is early, red is late, um, there's one more exploratory loop in a southwesterly direction on the next day, and then she's found something. She's found a, a profitable patch by this forest edge up there, and then visits that patch for several dozen foraging bouts. She now works like an assembly line worker, just going back and forth and back and forth to that um, single destination, does nothing but. 
And then the bee was stuck inside because of rain for a few days. And after that, she flies to that familiar previously visited patch a few more times, then appears to change her mind halfway along an outbound flight and returns to a different patch that she had only visited once on her very first flight ever 10 days earlier without the need apparently to retrace her um, steps. She goes straight to that other patch um, and then sticks with that patch for the rest of her days. So this was a, in a sense, a very methodical bee. Other individuals have very different careers and interface exploration with exploitation more frequently. But the important aspect here for, for me was this ability to retrieve a very distant spatial memory and go straight to that location without retracing her steps through the hive. Now, one of the things that's always grated on me when talking to um, colleagues working with, with uh, primates and corvid birds and so on, was they would always say, well, yeah, of course, bees have to be good at, um, at um, learning flower colors and, um, and memorizing space, but they're pre-programmed to learn this. Um, there's no particular challenge. So they said, because um, these are problems that are daily encountered daily by bees in their natural environments. And so one of the things that we uh, did with a friend, Carl Geiger, um, during our PhD, after, as Brian Butterworth recently wrote down in a book, perhaps too much whiskey, um, we asked if bees might be able to count landmarks. And so what we did here was to present bees with a series of identical landmarks, these tetrahedral tents of 3.5 meters height. And um, after training the bees to collect food after landmark three, we then produced contradictions between the entrained distance and the correct number of landmarks by either increasing the number of landmarks over the same distance or reducing it. And if we increased the number of landmarks over the same distance, bees tended to land at an earlier distance. Whereas if we reduced the number, they tended to overshoot the target and fly further. So they were indeed sensitive to uh, the number of, um, of the landmarks. And more recently, um, Actually, I'll skip this slide and uh, I'll have it explained from a recent documentary, part of which was filmed in our lab, Planet Insect. We've recently discovered something even more surprising about insects. It turns out that some are really, really smart. One test of intelligence in animals is when they're given a problem, they can work out a solution in their heads. Hang a piece of food from a perch, out of reach, and a smart bird like a raven soon works out what to do. Just pull the string, hold it with your foot, pull a bit more, and in no time at all, you have a snack. Yet anything a mere vertebrate can do. Bumblebees can also do this, even though they must be trained to solve the problem. Pull the string. Nectar. Now, this bee hasn't been trained at all. But if she's allowed to watch her nestmate solving the problem, she knows exactly what to do when she gets her turn. Teachers and students, and all with brains only the size of pinheads. Combine this with the flexibility of the basic insect layout and there's not much that insects can't do. Yeah, so there are various ways in which we can do these social learning tasks. One is by observation from a distance. 
that works even more efficiently if the bees are allowed to interact directly, as you can see in this video. So here are two individuals. One is the so-called demonstrator that we've marked with a red dot in the video, and the other is an inexperienced individual that's never pulled strings for rewards before. And typically at the start, this inexperienced bee just scrounges on the efforts of the experienced one. And now they're getting a bit antsy because they've actually finished the droplet that was in there in this well um, in, the, in the artificial flower. The experienced bee runs over to the next flower. The other one is still faffing about by the first one because she has no idea yet how the task works. But there's clearly an interest in the other bee. So she joins her repeatedly on that flower. And um, now again, um, just scrounges on the work of the experienced individual. And this is typically repeated a few times, but then the previously inexperienced bee will learn the task as well. And what you can then do is observe the spread of this unique skill of string pulling through a bumblebee colony, very much like a, a meme in a social media network in humans. So what we've done here is we've arranged all the individuals of a colony in a circle, each dot is one bee. And um, when there's a line between two dots, that means there's an interaction of the kind you've just seen in the video. And you can now see, so the, the originally trained individual is yellow 31 at the top. And you can now see that several dots have turned orangey. And that means when the dot turns colored, that bee has managed the task by herself for the first time. And so you have this whole set of orange bees that have all learned the task from yellow, but you can now see here, there's a purple bee on the bottom right. And that's an individual that has no longer picked up the task from the original knowledgeable individual, yellow 31, but from the second generation of learners from the orange bees. And so the skill continues to spread. Now there's a second purple bee, a second, third generation learner, so to speak, the skill in this colony actually continued to spread even after the original innovator, the yellow 31 had died. They only live a few weeks, so that happens. But the cultural skill, if you wish, the socially acquired skill continued to spread in that colony of bees even beyond the life of the original innovator. And if you do that with um, lots of bees, then you can indeed find that it almost looks as if they're collaborating. Clearly there's an attraction to pull on a string that's already being um, pulled, as you can see uh, in this video here. So for the next experiment, I'll let um, Jane Goodall do the introduction. The most recent uh, example which blows people's minds is the bumblebee. And the bumblebee has been taught to roll a little ball. He rolls it backwards, rolls the little ball until he can push it down, or maybe she, I don't know, into a, a hole, like a goal. And as soon as this little ball gets into the goal, the bumblebee is given a little drop of nectar as a reward. So they learn to do this. But the mind blowing thing is other bumblebees who've merely watched a taught bumblebee can do the same without being taught just by watching. And that is supposed to be a mark of very superior intelligence. So this is something we're learning all the time. We have been far too arrogant. The animal kingdom of which we are a part is filled with secrets. And gosh, I'd love to be young and learning about these things now because all the doors are wide open and you never know what you're going to find. Yeah, so this was very moving for me because Jane Goodall was one of my sort of early heroines and was one of the reasons why I went into animal behavior in the first place. And, for her to recognize our bee work and say, hey, I'd like to be young now and uh, study bees was quite something. Yeah, so just to fill this with a bit more um, meat. So the, um, the task, as Jane Goodall explained, is for the bees to get a ball into 
the central goal area, um, and then she gets a, a, a drop of sugar reward. But for the social learning, we've actually played a little trick here. And that is, so in this task, there are three balls. And obviously the best way to solve the task, the most efficient way is to use the closest ball, the one that's already closest to the target. Now this central B at the um, bottom here, however, has learned that she can't, that can't be done because the two closest balls are actually glued to the surface. She knows she can't move that one. So she always goes straight to this ball and moves it to the center because she's learned that's the only mobile ball. And that's what the observer bee on the right gets to see. So she sees a, uh, the task being performed as moving the furthest ball. And so this is what happens. The um, experienced individual moves the furthest ball to the, the center and then they both get a big dollop of, uh, of sugar water. And after witnessing this three times, we're then putting that observer bee on the spot and asking, how would you solve the task? And the question is, of course, would she simply ape the demonstrator and copy the actions that she's seen performed or will she do the clever thing and move the closest ball? And this is what typically happens. So you can see she's quite clumsy still because she's never rolled balls for reward before, but she tends to pick either the closest or the second closest, almost never the one that's far away. So she's not copying the actions. She's copying what we think is the desired end state, so to speak, with an idea of how to get there, right? There's no trial and error here. She doesn't try the two, the three different balls and finds out, aha, uh -huh, it's more effort to move the furthest one, but spontaneously picks the closest ball. Now, bees, do bees have mental representations of things, including flowers? Um, we know that they're good at recognizing flowers and flower patterns and so on, but if you do some neural network modeling, you can actually find that even very simple neural networks with just some fairly primitive feature detectors that detect edge orientation and color and so on can actually serve identifying the right flowers nearly all the time without the need for, you, for the bees to store a little virtual image of their targets in their heads. But one way to get at the question of whether there is a kind of mental representation of, of uh, an object in someone's or something's head is by asking whether that something, that object is accessible from multiple different sensory modalities. So we're asking here, can it be recognized something that she's only seen but not touched? by using her tactile sense subsequently. So the task is a little bit similar to um, the perhaps now extinct birthday party um, kitty game where you were either blindfolded or you're, you're reaching into a dark bag and you have to identify using your tactile sense, a spoon, a screwdriver, a key or something like that. An object that you've previously only seen but not touched. And so that requires that you have some sort of a picture of the, that thing in your head. You can't just store the sensory input that you've already experienced. And so what we have here is a very fairly simple task where um, bees have to learn either to associate balls or cubes, depending on which group they're in, with reward, but can only see these objects because they're under a plexiglass lid in this uh, particular training. And subsequently we ask, can the same bees then recognize the same objects using their tactile sense in complete darkness under infrared light? And it turns out that they can. The bees that have been trained to associate the visual stimulus that comes with the ball can find the ball by using their tactile sense alone and then spend longer times on it in darkness. And you can do the reverse as well. You can train the bees first under infrared light in darkness to find the correct objects using the tactile sense, and then subsequently testing them in the light. And again, they find the correct objects with higher than chance, which to us indicates that indeed there is some sort of a mental representation of object properties rather than just storing sensory parameters. Now, given all this uh, work with um, bees and balls, um, 
it seems perhaps natural to ask whether they actually like playing with balls. Uh, and it turns out that they do. So um, Samadhi Galpayaga did her PhD on this um, topic, um, and specifically the question of whether there's something inherently enjoyable to the activity. And in this experiment, the bees actually have to go out of their way to get access to an arena that has balls in it where there are never any rewards and they've never experienced balls um, with, uh, with uh, sugary rewards. In fact, they have free access to a feeding station if they want to go directly to it, but these bees detour through the, the, the play chamber, so, so to speak, again and again. Um, so they're repeatedly coming back even though no food is ever offered. Perhaps unsurprisingly, it's also young bees that do this more than older bees and perhaps equally unsurprisingly male bees do it a lot more than female bees um, in part because um, male bees are perfectly useless as far as any work for the colony is concerned so they have a lot more spare time on their hands. Now that takes us to the last um, question that I want to explore. The qu question is that if you find some activities that are inherently enjoyable without there being any appetitive reward, um, then could it be said that um, bees have some sort of emotion-like state? And probably 20 years ago, um, everyone, including myself, would have ridiculed even that suggestion. Um, I've, there was an experiment we did 15 years ago that um, was a bit of an eye-opener for me, um, and we simply wanted to find out if bees can learn to avoid predation threat. And one of the things that bees have to watch out for are these kinds of cramp spiders that lurk on flowers and just wait there for unassuming um, flower visitors. They can also, like a chameleon, adopt the color on which they prey, at least in some species. We took that situation into the laboratory um, by, um, building these life-sized um, models of crab spiders paired with a solenoid-driven pincer mechanisms where we could briefly capture a bee and then release it as in an unsuccessful predation attempt. And that happens commonly in nature. The bees uh, not, not so rarely manage to get away. And that, of course, creates an opportunity to learn from the experience. So here's one such um, flight. First land on a, on a safe flower. And now she makes a mistake. She lands on a spider infested flower. You can tell the bee is more than pissed off, but, um, but there, there's actually no physical harm done. So these sponge pads are very um, soft. Um, but the, uh, so the bees learned to avoid these. Um, spider infested flowers quite swiftly after just a few trials but what was well to do with that their whole demeanor changed so they would scan every flower quite carefully before landing especially if they had experienced that the spiders were cryptic so this here is a conspicuous example of a white spider on yellow but if the bees had learned that the spiders are yellow on ye yellow they would actually scan for much longer but the most remarkable and perhaps surprising thing for, for us was the observation of a very high frequency of false alarms. That is, that the bees would scan a flower that was perfectly safe and then reject it as if they'd seen a ghost of a spider. Um, so they responded to a threat that was not actually currently present, but they simply conjured it up from memory somehow. And this at least superficially, anthropomorphologically speaking, um, did look a bit like a post-traumatic stress disorder of responding to a threat that was actually um, just in the past, not actually present on the current flower. But of course, it's not yet a formal demonstration of any kind of emotion-like state, but it certainly looked that way. Now, how might one more formally test whether uh, bees or other animals have emotion-like states? So one paradigm that is used in a variety of different animals, rats first, but also um, some domestic animals, where you're interested in whether they're, they're kept under conditions that are conducive to their well-being or not, as the case may be, so dogs and goats and so on. Um, one such paradigm is basically built on the proverbial glass that for us humans is either half full or half empty. So you have an, 
an ambiguous stimulus. Here's our glass. That's exactly 50% filled. And the optimist um, among us would say, well, there's still plenty in there. Everything's good. And the pessimist might say, responding to the same stimulus, it's already almost gone. We'd be all sad about it. And so various versions of this um, paradigm have been used in um, animal psychology. And we adapted this paradigm for the world of bees as follows. So we have our little flight arena shown in A at the top, and the bee flies in and uh, learns that if there's, let's say, blue on the left is always a reward. If there's green on the right, there is never a reward. So blue is the, the positive stimulus. Um, and green is the negative one. Of course, we had a balance design for other groups doing it the other way around. So the bee learns one color in one position is a good thing, the other color in the other position is not. Then the question is, how does she respond to the ambiguous stimuli that is turquoise, for example, in the middle? Is that neutral stimulus now judged as something more likely being a good thing or not as the case may be? And after some training, what you find is that whenever the good stimulus is presented, blue on the left, the bee flies there without any kind of hesitation. If on the other end, we're giving her green, she knows there's never a reward there from the past. She'll fly about for minutes until she might finally, after two, three minutes, decide, okay, if nothing else is forthcoming, then I might as well try that green stimulus. So the hesitation or acceptance is clearly recognizable from the, the, the time delay with which the, the bee lands on these targets. And now the question, of course, is what happens with the ambiguous stimulus, turquoise, turquoise in the middle? That's the, that's the glass 50% filled, and we're asking the bee, hey, does this look more likely like a rewarding thing or not, as the case may be? And it turns out that the response depends on what happened before the bee enters the setup. If they're given a little surprise reward, a tiny droplet of sugar water, before they're doing the test, before they're even going into the arena in a location which was surprising because they never got a reward there before, then their response times to the ambiguous stimuli were much lower. So what we see on this graph on the right here is the response times to the positive stimulus, blue on the left, always very short, under 10 seconds on average. The negative stimulus, green on the right, they're sort of almost 10 minutes, uh, sorry, two minutes on average, and all the other responses are in between. But the crucial difference here is between the red and the black curve. The red curve is for the ambiguous stimuli after the bees have had a little surprise reward before entering the test. And in that case, for all the ambiguous stimuli, um, turquoise in the middle and all the variations in between, the response times become much shorter. So they're responding to these previously unseen ambiguous stimuli as more likely being something rewarding. It turns out that this um, optimism-like state is dopamine dependent. So they, they seem to get a little dopamine hit when they're getting the, um, the sucrose reward and then judging all these ambiguous stimuli as more likely being rewarding. Jerry Wright at Oxford has done the, 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 the opposite experiment where instead of a surprise reward, the bees were given a surprise predation attack. And in that case, the whole curve shifts in the opposite direction. So the reservation to the ambiguous stimuli is then greater than it would otherwise be. So there's in that case, a kind of pessimism like reservation about these ambiguous stimuli. How are we doing for time? Do we have like five more minutes? Okay, no one is protesting. Um, I won't go um, too deeply into um, the brains of bees, just uh, to make you appreciate they're beautiful. Um, so here's the frontal view of, of a bee's brain. The optic lobes are um, shown in, in various shades of blue, the lamina, medulla, and globula. Um, the antennal lobes, this uh, sort of what looks like an old fashioned telephone dial, for the older generation here, um, is, the, uh, is, is for processing chemosensory information from the antenna. And both converge then, or send convergent uh, tracts to the mushroom body, centers, centers of um, um, multisensory integration and um, associative 
learning and memory. The number of neurons in a bee's brain is small compared, well, not to a C. elegans or Drosophila, but compared to our 85 billion. So um, it's depending on species, but up to or under um, a million neurons. Um, so that might suggest that there can't be much going on in there in a brain as tiny as that until you look at actually the structure of individual neurons in the bee's brain. Here's just one cell, one cell from um, a bee's brain. This uh, cell seems to largely constitute the um, appetitive reward pathway in a honeybee's brain, uh, discovered by Martin Hammer in the 1990s. So down here is the, the, the soma, and then it has very extensive ramifications throughout the internal lobes, as well as through the calyces of the, the mushroom bodies, the lateral horn, and so on. So the structure of any one such neuron can be as finely branched as a fully grown tree. And this complexity, of course, was recognized quite early on by Ramon y Cajal, who didn't just study vertebrate brains, but was actually very interested in, in insect brains. Here's a drawing over a century old from uh, by Ramon y Cajal with a good number of identified neurons in um, the honeybee um, optic lobes, lobula, lobula medulla and, um, sorry, lamina, medulla, and lobula. Um, and here's what he said about insect brains. The excellence of the psychic machine does not increase with zoological hierarchy. Instead, one realizes that in fish and amphibians, the nervous centers have undergone an unexpected simplification. Sorry, fish people. <laughs> of course, their gray matter has increased considerably in mass, but when the structure of their brain is compared with that of bees or dragonflies, they're excessively plain, coarse, and rudimentary. <laughs> It is as if one were to pretend to hold as equals the merits of a rough grandfather clock with the quality of a fine pocket watch, a marvel of fineness, delicacy, and precision. As always, in building her marvelous works, nature distinguishes herself much more in her tiny creations than in the large. So just to wrap this up, um, I think there is, in, in the sort of general question of whether bees could be said to, to have a mind, um, there seems to be reasonably good evidence that there are indeed representations of things and of space, that they can manipulate objects in a manner that indicates at least some sort of awareness of, um, of the potential outcomes, and they also have a flexible access to past spatial memories. And at least by the same criteria that are also used in domestic animals, they appear to have some form of emotional extent. We're not lowering the bar, we're using the same criteria, of course. And these are, I think, key ingredients of a mind. And I think all of this inspires for me, at least, some sense of awe and, uh, and respect for these other minds that are um, all around us, however alien they might be. And I think there is, well, there, there is now, I think, a general appreciation in the public and in the media that we should conserve bees because they do a useful service for us. They pollinate uh, a large majority of our crops, so they feed us um, and they, they pollinate our garden flowers and so on. But that's, that's an angle through utility. It's asking, well, they're doing something useful for us, so maybe we should, uh, we should keep them. But what I think this line of research also shows is that there is perhaps uh, from the respect that arises from recognizing that these are most likely sentient beings, um, a slightly different angle towards the need for their conservation that of course applies to other insects just as well. That is, if you think about how people think about the conservation of, about, of iconic mammals, whatever, panda bears and Siberian tigers, then our motivation to um, assist let's say, financially with conservation campaigns is one of empathy. We sympathize with these animals because we think they must suffer from the deterioration of their habitats, from um, the difficulty to find mating partners and so on. And that's what motivates our help. And that angle, I think, in insect conservation is not yet present. And I think it's an important one that emerges from this research. Now, 
you already mentioned I've got this fresh book out. Um, if anyone would, would like a copy, there are some over here. Thank you very much. Okay, great. So I think we have time for some questions. That was really great. So we have some time for some questions. Uh, yeah, Elena, I think it's on. Uh, thanks a lot. That was very inspiring talk. Um, I just went back. Well, I have two questions. So I'm still related with how much is both the mine of wheat and the super mine of wheat, I guess, and the ability of the mine of wheat to really do the obviously the process on its own, and how much is this because they have a strong social interaction. And um, so two questions are related. So you showed at the beginning that um, bees can um, build different bee hives, right, in different ways. And if you remove, for instance, the hierarchy or if you add different structures, they can still come up with different solutions, right? But to me, it's like, is this really a flexibility within or a mind of bee, or is it just because of nature? So what the way the bees can do is simply build a beehive on a surface that is not the vertical surface, but what they do, they build it on a tree. So they are means that they could you could even have a structure that is just because if you so bees that have some instruction instructions that are all the same. So just build something with the lowest energy, you know, like use gravity or use something else. But then if you have not a surface that is slippery, you can create this beautiful um construction so to me it's not that it be flexible but maybe it just each time the bees they still have the same structure and what you create is just because of like the situation okay so how can you distinguish or how, how can you be certain that it's like you know a major master of plants or is it that you still have these and similar structures mm -hmm. okay. So to the first question, of course, the vast majority of bee species are solitary, not social. So there's plenty of room for comparisons, at least. Um, so the solitary bees share with those of social bees many of the, the obvious challenges, including the need for a precise spatial memory including the need to recognize rewarding flowers and reject unrewarding flowers. Um, they will not have the need for communication within their colonies, but many of the, the uh, most obvious challenges are shared between the social and the solitary species. And in line with that, the little information we have about their learning ability. So I actually started my work with comparing color learning abilities in a variety of different Bee and wasp species, including some solitary ones, no difference. Um, so they're they're very good at learning colors as predictors of reward or as signposts at the nest entrance. Um, we did one study recently on the learning abilities of solitary bees at the nest entrance and asking. So when bees decide, solitary bees decide where to nest, they um, often look for signs of parasitization in nearby nests. And if there's evidence that parasites have drilled into the nests, they'll just go somewhere else. And it turns out in this context, the bees can actually learn very rapidly to associate even abstract symbols, triangles or squares with signs of parasitization and subsequently reject the same nesting locations in the vicinity of other such locations. Um, Interestingly, when we published the string pulling work, um, someone sent us a little video of um, a um, bee that had made its nest in a hole in a brick wall. And someone, um, just for fun, I guess, so this was obviously not a scientific experiment, pushed a nail into that entrance hole. And the, the bee that subsequently landed there, immediately, rather than just stupidly pushing past the nail, actually tried to pull it out. So she seemed to understand what was the, 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 the goal of what, what, what her actions would be. She tried different methods, including standing on the 
male in flirt, wearing her wings backwards to generate some thrust away from the wall and managed quite quickly to get the male. Now that's just anecdotal, but it's a similar kind of task as of course with uh, string pulling. So solitary bees are hugely understudied, especially given their um, diversity. And the fact they far outnumber the numbers of um, solitary species, that's for simple convenience. Obviously we work largely with solitary bees because it's easier to get large sample sizes because they're easily kept in laboratories in this century long histories about how to best keep them. So there's lots that remains to be explored. On your other question, so um, in natural conditions, bees never, honeybees never start building a comb on the bottom and build it gradually up. So what they, they naturally nest in cavities, which um, beekeepers of course exploit by giving them um, boxes of various geometries, but um, naturally they nest in, um, in hollow trees. Some species of honeybees also um, build their combs on, on tree branches or overhanging cliffs, but always starting at the, bot at the top and then working gradually down. So that's a new challenge. A glass ceiling is a new challenge uh, and one that hasn't come up in the evolutionary history of bees so far. So there is a departure from the challenges they natu naturally face. But I think the, of course, most radical departure from um, the, the natural conditions and for, for me, the most impressive bit was the experiment where bees started building a comb laterally through a cavity and were then presented with a target wall that was uh, rendered slippery and where they took corrective action before reaching that sort of out uh, the, the potentially suboptimal outcome of building all the way to the target wall. Days before that, that outcome would have been reached, they already corrected the structure. So if you, we take that as face value, and I don't have any reason to doubt these experiments, we just would have to replicate them with larger sample sizes, but it certainly shows a kind of plasticity that you wouldn't necessarily expect if they were just following the, the kind of uh, construction plan that they usually use under natural conditions. Okay, so a couple more questions maybe, Mark? Hi. Uh, I, I had actually quite a similar question, I think, to, to the first one, which is how much is this because bees are social? Or so, so for someone who's not a behavioral biologist, I think I agree with the, the, the you know, human exceptionalism being overrated. I think it's, it's pretty clear there's a continuum of intelligence, whatever you want to call it. But, but how much of that is driven by the social aspect? So, so say, how, much, how many of these behaviors in your study would, would also be, say, in Drosophila, say, for instance, which is really quite well studied? Um, and, and how much is due to this decision? Um, in Drosophila, I suspect you'd have a hard time getting them to pull strings and learning that by observing each other. But that being said, um, so if you're asking, um, the more general question about consciousness, for example, then one really impressive experiment very recently was uh, one on fruit flies being able to keep track of time in a delayed uh, conditioning experiments where the, the flies had not just to learn that a certain stimulus predicts a reward, but actually measure the interval between these um, stimuli, which in mammals, at least this kind of ability to keep track of time between the CS and US is uh, a, a marker of consciousness. And this was a um, paper by, by Greenspan and others, which interestingly also involved uh, Jean-Pierre Changeux, who was one of the sort of leading researchers in human and primate consciousness. Um, so there are signs for some sort of uh, a mind as well in uh, in fruit flies, but I, I suspect that some of these uh, intelligence tests that we're running with, in this case, social bees um, might be might not be um, passed by Drosophila, but I might also be proven wrong. So I would have suggested in the past, for example, that um, 
that uh, fruit flies won't be able to solve any of the numerosity tasks that we've tried with bees. But there was a recent study, I think last year by um, Mercedes Mingochea from Argentina, who um, actually did uh, train flies in a simple numerosity task. So who knows? Um, and in solitary bees, I've already mentioned, um, there, there's lot, lots to be explored. There's a huge biodiversity of biologies, and they are understudied in terms of their cognition. Okay. I think we're running out of time now, so uh, let's thank Lars again for the great talk and the videos and questions.